Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Great Leadership. My guest today is Jim Barr, the CEO and board chair at Nautilus Inc. Jim, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Look forward to it. Yeah, we were actually just talking before I hit the record button. I got this uh, this new set of Nautilus dumbbells that you guys sent me that I'm using every day. So I'm a huge fitness and eating healthy nut. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, really excited to talk to you. I have so many questions for you. For, awesome. for people who are not familiar with the brand and the company, they might be more familiar with a lot of the brands that you have. So can you give people a little bit of context around the company, how big you guys are, what some of your brands are? Yes, absolutely. So we're, uh, we're Nautilus Inc. We're uh, ticker symbol N NLS, been around for about 40 years or so. So we've been around in the, in the fitness space uh, for quite some time. Our main brand is Bowflex. So more people know Bowflex than know the company name um, Nautilus. And in fact, we're going to change the company uh, company name coming up quite soon. Um, we have spoiler alert. We haven't said what it is, but I think you could probably figure out it has something to do with our number one brand. We also have go to market under the Schwinn brand. So we have uh, indoor cycling and indoor pedal. We call it pedal power under the Schwinn brand. And the third uh, brand that we use is Journey, which is our digital experience, our connected fitness experience that goes across both of those brands and sometimes uh, maybe eventually off, off of our own uh, equipment onto other people's equipment. And, and Journey is the digital brand that makes the equipment better. So no longer is uh, the day that you buy the equipment the best um, day that you have the equipment. So for example, uh, your dumbbells now come with a um, with a uh, visual software that counts your reps for you and actually tell you whether you're doing it right. So form coach. So that's oh, wow. individualized connectedness under the journey brand. So those are our three uh, major brands uh, right now. We're not really selling anything anymore under the Nautilus brand. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, and how many employees do you guys have? How many customers? I mean, anything to give people a, a sense of context as far as uh, the business? Sure, absolutely. So employees about 400. Uh, we're in an asset light model, meaning we don't own our own factories. We work with uh, contractors uh, manufacturing in uh, in Asia to do that, and uh, that keeps our uh, keeps us. We set, we call it asset light and um, and uh, variable cost, uh, in, as opposed to owning factories and things like that. But 400 fairly passionate uh, employees. Uh, uh, and, and we're located in, uh, in Vancouver, Washington, our headquarters, but we have DCs in um, Columbus, Ohio, and in Southern California. We have operations in China and um, also develop software in, in Zurich and a couple other places in Europe. Oh, very cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you got into that role. So can you take us through a little bit of your career journey? Because I was... Uh, browsing your LinkedIn profile, and I saw that way back in the day you were actually at Encyclopedia Britannica, and you were. Uh, this was in the '90s, uh, and I think it was the first job you had on LinkedIn. Were you? Did you have a previous job before that? Yeah, I mean, before uh, before that, I was. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a general manager someday. Didn't know if I'd be running a small division, big division, or be CEO somewhere, but knew that's what I wanted to do. So I collected experiences. Started out at one of the big uh, big CPA firms. Oh, PwC, with, so you were at right? No, uh, it was uh, it was Ernst or oh, EY today. Ernst, EY, okay. Yeah, so I did that, and then um, I did a little bit of investment banking, a little bit of management consulting back at EY, and then I went with my first client, um, Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, as I, I helped them kind of restructure things, and uh, thought I could see if I could save them with my first transformation. It's crazy to think of a time that you worked for a company where you actually sold physical encyclopedias to people. Do you remember what those used to cost? Like how much did a set of encyclopedias yeah. cost? Uh, around $2,500, oh right? My and so, God. and they cost about $300 worth of paper and ink. Oh. Um, but then of course you have all these Nobel laureates that are writing the articles and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a great, it's a great piece of work, but it, you know, kind of in my first transformation, the one thing I learned was competitive substitutes are very important and people yeah. forget that they're much broader than World Book, for example, back then. They were soon to be Wikipedia. They were starting to bundle encyclopedias. Microsoft had an encyclopedia online, those types of things. And so uh, it was it was a really good first experience in transformations. And later, of course, I, I went to Microsoft. Um, that's probably my most formative uh, experience in digital. I'm, I would call myself a, 
a digital e-commerce person and spent 12 years there running B2C e-commerce for Microsoft and working with some really smart people kind of at the dawn of the consumer internet all the way till um, 2008 or so. Then uh, I became president of Sears, its first online president. So again, I like this transformation. I remember Sears. Yeah, I like these. Yeah, yeah, you remember. <laughs> I think it's fading a little bit, but uh, but you know, could we save the stores? Could we save online? They had to compete against Amazon, and they weren't really set to do that. Yeah. And then um, I went uh, after that. I went to Office Max, Office Depot. We merged those two companies together. Uh, then I went to Ritchie Brothers, the CEO um, from Office Max went to Ritchie Brothers. I sort of kind of forewent my first CEO offer to do one more uh, stance with that CEO because I really enjoyed working with him. And then uh, today. So I think the common themes really uh, for the latter part of the career is um, companies that are still very, very good. And in the case of Microsoft, you know, the the top market cap in, in the entire world at the time. Yeah. Um, but they missed trends. Like even at Microsoft, we missed the iPhone, we missed search and Google got it. We missed uh, tablets. We were trying to defend and, you know, really protect um, ourselves so much with Windows and Office that we missed some major trends. So I, yeah. I tell people and when I'm doing these transformations, now I've done five or six of them. That's the common theme is, you know, you're you just kind of lose track of your your customer journey. Uh, and you have some kind of uh, disruption, either technological or a change in value proposition. And this is what I love to do. Yeah, it's interesting that, uh, you know, these $2,500 encyclopedias are now totally free that anybody can access. And this was like an actual business built on selling something that is now free, which is just crazy to think about. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you mentioned a couple of things there that I wanted to jump on. One was you said that during your career, you collected experiences um, and so I wanted to, to touch on that and then to maybe explore why some people miss trends. And I'm going to make myself a note here so I don't forget. Yep. Why don't we start off with the first one as far as collecting experiences? So what do you mean by that? Because I think a lot of people assume that for their careers, you kind of have this corporate ladder, right? And if you start off in marketing, you become a you know, marketing manager, director, senior, and you kind of just climb that one path and you don't get those experiences, so how did you first figure out that that's something that you needed to do? I mean, how did you figure out what experiences you needed and what role did that play in ultimately becoming CEO of your own company? Sure, absolutely. Well, I kind of knew at a younger age that I wanted to run a business. Like you did? I, I, okay. My, yeah, my, my dad... My dad was, you know, uh, middle management at AT and T, um, and then went uh, eventually became a CEO um, later in his career. Um, but uh, but I kind of we had dinner time conversations about what was uh, what it was like to run a business, and I sort of loved the idea of a P and L, where that was absolutely the the core measurement of your performance is you you have all these lines, you understand the levers, and you run this business to get a result. And, uh, and, and you, uh, you, at the same time, you cultivate relationships with people. So I loved everything about that. So I knew I wanted to do that in some form. And then if you're going to do that and you take that as a, as a, a given, uh, then what do you need? You really kind of need to rotate against things. You may not be a master at any one thing. Eventually, my, you know, I became a master at what, what didn't exist at that time, which is the digital economy and, yeah. the, and e-commerce. Uh, but I didn't know that would even exist. So um you know, I became that, but I knew, look, I, I became a CPA, not because I wanted a career being a CPA, right? But I did want to learn how to read financial statements. I knew that was going to be important. Important. I got my finance degree uh, at night, so I, I got that experience as well. I worked in um, investment banking, so I got to see how transactions were and, and how the stock market worked, and I thought that would be important to capital markets later in my career. And then uh, management consulting, where I saw you know, kind of each company's biggest problems. I didn't love that I couldn't stick around and solve them. So that's why I didn't stay as a consultant. But I did like the fact that you were working on really important work. And, you know, at, as a somebody in your 20s, for example, you're really working on super important stuff um, going forward. Mm. Um, so if you were giving advice to people in their careers now uh, to collect those experiences, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I think that I, I, I do see people moving around for a little bit of money. And I always kind of say, 
you know, think about the experiences that you can you can get. Um, and, you know, it's OK to move. It's a different world than it was back then. You know, back then you were like, hey, the best thing you can do is just go to one company and stay there forever. Yeah, so I know yeah. it isn't that that same thing. But um, be mindful, first, of where you have some idea where you're going. I guess that would be ma general management for me. Um, and try to pick an area where there's growth, you know, um, ended, ended up that being e-commerce for me. Um, but look for that and then just collect the experiences that you think will make you good at that uh, along the way. Certainly the stuff we always talk about, volunteer yeah. for extra things, try to find learning wherever you can, try to find somebody that can really teach you um, and, and help you learn and be a good mentor. Um, all of those types of things. So, you know, it's kind of the combination of picking an area that's likely to be a high growth area, because yep. I'll tell you just even the Nautilus experience that I've had both ways, it's better to have tailwinds than headwinds. And oh, so yeah, you can pick an area sure. where, where you're going to have uh, tailwinds, that's better. And then collect the experiences that will make you make you good at that good at that job. And then along the way, of course, be super intellectually uh, curious uh, and learn everything you can. I always tell people it's better to focus on who you're going to be working with instead of the the company and yeah. and the money, right? Because ultimately earlier on, and even probably even in the middle of your career, who you work with and who you learn from is going to matter much more than the brand that you work for and how much money you make. Um, which Absolutely. is interesting because I, I saw that you, you worked with Ravi Saligram for a while. And so I, I've interviewed him. He's actually one of the CEOs I have in my book. And, uh, oh, and, and so I was doing research on you and I saw that you mentioned working with him. And so I'm very curious, kind of building on that point, what was that relationship like? Did you learn a lot from him? Did you specifically want to work with him? And what, what was the impact there? Because I think that's probably a great case study in why the leader matters more than the money in the company that you're a part of. Yes, absolutely. So Ravi and I first worked together at, at Office Max and he slowly but surely got me in as a consultant. You know, the, the OfficeMax.com website was yeah. broken. Oh, and I, uh, let me, let me point down. out who, who Ravi is. I forgot. So Ravi Saligram now, I think yeah. he's the CEO of a uh, new old brand, right? Um, which is the, the just retired. Just oh, he just retired. retired fairly recently. Yeah, but so Newell Brands, they had um, uh, Sharpie was their their big brand. Um, let me actually look on their their site to to see who some of their other their big brands. Draco, yeah, oh, Coleman, baby. I think Coleman. was another one. So oh, here it is. Oh wow, way more brands than even so. Elmer's, Sharpie. Uh, Graco, uh, Food Saver, Rubbermaid, Coleman, of course, Contigo. So Newell is the, the parent company behind all of those. And Ravi was the CEO who, yes, just very recently retired. So, okay, go ahead. No, so we first got together when he was CEO of, of Office Max, a pretty new CEO in his you know, assessment of what transformation had to happen there. You know, office supplies, not a super passionate category, right? And like, it's more utilitarian. So we were kind of working against uh, that. But, you know, the website was broken. He needed some help. He heard about me. I uh, He gave me a call. I, I kind of helped as a consultant. And he is super persuasive. Before I knew it, I like... <laughs> I put together a plan for him and then all of a sudden he made me run it. So uh, then all of a sudden I'm working for him and that's it. He doesn't take no for an answer. And uh, so I really enjoyed that, but he's driving an overall transformation yeah. and I'm the digital guy that has, you know, all the digital stuff at the company, um, you know, have to fit it in with stores. So I have to play nice with, uh, with the stores and all that kind of stuff. But he and I together, um, you know, with our executive team basically transformed that and, Office Max is not a growing category or office supplies, not a growing category. Uh, so we ended up merging it with uh, with Office Depot. That was kind of the exit. When you don't have a growth there, you kind of have to yeah. get some consolidation. And that's what we did. But we had a great time together. We know we really fixed the uh, digital experiences and we got growth out of the company and, uh, you know, exciting to uh, to bring it together with uh, with Office Depot. So what did you and learn? Then, and then of course, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to bridge to the to the next time that I worked for him because because he he doesn't take no for an answer and I was going to go there but we can we can save that no for no after no please questions. go 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 <clears throat> so then um, after after we merged the two companies together um, I was thinking about what what's my next thing going to be and I got a great offer to be CEO my first CEO gig he knew 
is one of these leaders who always, and I try to emulate this too, always know what your directs want to do and help them get there personally, right? So he yep. knows I want to be a CEO someday. And so he's in the background helping me with that. And I ended up with a uh, CEO offer and he did my reference call. Uh, and wow. then he calls me up a little bit later and said, but I got this other thing to think about. And I'm like, what? And then he tells me about Richie Brothers, who's the leader in uh, secondhand industrial equipment auctions. And I'm like, I've never heard of them, but they end up being really good and a really rich um, a transformation for us. We can get into that later. But I, uh -huh. he persuaded me to defer my my first CEO gig until later and join him there. And I really, really enjoyed that wow. experience. Wow. Well, so he convinced you to defer your first CEO gig, huh? Yep. That's crazy. Yep. That's he like said, a big opportunity. Gonna be big. We're going to be able to, to transform this public company, you know, double, triple the market cap if we do it right. Um, they have this online, I mean, they have this um, on site auction where you have to move the bulldozers to that site. You only do it four or five times a year at each site. And so mm -hmm. the value proposition seems to be eroding. Yeah. And so, again, another example of the consumer or the customer behavior changing, but the, the, the company not. And they're still growing a little bit, but uh, but we ended up putting online versions of the uh, of the auction next to these and give customers more choice and then capture a greater share of, uh, of the wallet of people who try to sell their stuff. So pretty, pretty cool experience there. Too. Yeah, I'm very curious. What is it about Ravi? Because a lot of people would say, wow, you turned down a CEO role to go work with this leader. Yeah. What was it about Ravi? What what made him a good leader? What was he able to unlock in you? And just to give you some context around why I'm asking this, and again, it's kind of going back to this point of why I think it's so important for people to pay attention to the leaders that they work with and, you know, why that's important. Like, what can a good leader do for you? And why is it so important to make sure you work for the right leader? And so I'm curious, from your perspective, going by that same context and question, what did Ravi do for you? What was it about Ravi that made you want to work with him? What was he able to unlock in, in you as, as your potential? Yeah. So I'd say the first thing is to sell me on the idea of the transformation. You know, somebody like me, who's kind of um, really locked in on having a passion for changing things and for, um, for making companies better, so he taking what's vision. good about them. Yeah, take, taking what's what's good about them and emulating that and what needs to change and making the case for change around that. Um, so it was the transformation. He's like, gee, this this company is great. They're very fan they're fantastic at what they do, but they're becoming less relevant over time because other things like um, classified advertising online and other ways to sell the equipment are coming in. And we're just focusing on the thing we do well. So I want yeah. you to come in and make it a broader a broader play and uh, capture the market share that way. And so it was that to start with. And then I, I mentioned it before, I think great leaders um, really understand you as a person and what makes you tick. So he knew that that transformation was going to get was going to get me going. He knew that um, the experiences that we had together would be helpful. There was a possibility that if things went uh, a certain pace, that I would succeed him in that, too. So that was part of part of it as well. Um, those things don't always work out that way, and everybody knows going into them that's that 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 might be the case. Um, but uh, but it was really that package of things. And I know he brings together great teams. So my teammates in both places were people I trusted. We all rooted for each other and had great, you know, great at just all the attributes of a of, yeah. of a great team. So I knew he wasn't going to let us down that way. So I knew we were going to have a strategy that I had a pretty good sense of that I was going to be important in that strategy. And then I knew I was going to work with some some great people at the company. So if we were to break those down into maybe a series of bullets, so it sounds like number one, um, sold you the vision, sold you the yep. the dream, the proposition. Uh, number two, told you that or created and proposed a compelling strategy that you knew you were going to play an integral role in. So having an impact, so to speak. Um, yep. Number three, then it sounds like knowing that you were going to be a part of a good team. Um, and then I think there was just a fourth one that you were saying too. Was there a fourth component or was it just those three? The dream, the strategy, I think and the team. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's actually very good advice of what 
what a leader can do. And so did he push you out of your comfort zone a little bit and get you to be a better version of yourself, to be a better leader yourself? And did it prepare you more to become the CEO of the company you're at now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, it's like uh, the game of soccer. My, my kids all played soccer. Sometimes the best move isn't straight to the goal every time, right? Sometimes it's a move that's sideways or or with a with with an idea there. So I, I knew by going to uh, to Ritchie Brothers that I was going to be um, have a pivotal role. Um, I knew it was going to be difficult to persuade the people there that making the case for change was going to be tougher than other places. Other places yeah. you go, you know, the business is crashing down. So yes, of course we have to change. But at Ritchie Brothers, they were still doing okay. They just weren't growing very fast, and so we had to make the change. So I felt like we could you know, we, we could, uh, we could definitely, uh, do that. The topic of vulnerability is front and center inside of a lot of organizations today, but should you actually be vulnerable at work in my brand new book, leading with vulnerability, I actually say that you should not be vulnerable at work, but instead you should lead with vulnerability. The difference vulnerability is about exposing a gap Whereas leading with vulnerability is about exposing a gap that you have and then demonstrating what you are trying to do to close that gap. To figure out how to make all of this happen, I interviewed over 100 CEOs and surveyed 14,000 employees around the world. And I put all of that into my brand new book, which just came out. You can learn more by heading over to leadwithvulnerability.com. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about competition, competitors, and this is where I think maybe missing trends or spotting trends is important. So I, I think it's probably safe to say that the, your your biggest competitor in the space would probably be a, a brand like Peloton, right? Peloton or iFit, probably those are the two people would know, but Peloton's the only other public company. Yeah, I think uh, most like people are, I mean, I've heard of iFit, but I feel like they're not I mean, are they as popular as, as you guys and as Peloton? It's, are they... Nordic, it's Nordic Track. So oh, if you've Nordic heard of the brand, okay. Nordic... Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so Nordic Track, the brand they, you've got. They changed their corporate name to be, uh, uh, you know, to, to relate to their their version of Journey. I told you our digital experience. Yeah, they yeah. Call are, are they also publicly but... traded? No, they're not. They're okay. private. That's why... That's why you know, people don't talk about them as much. But if you were to go to, go to Dick's Sporting Goods, you'd see, yes. you'd see their products are private. Okay. So I'm curious about, um, let's take Peloton as an example, right, as, yep. as kind of a competitor. So um, I, I know when you uh, took over CEO of Nautilus, obviously the company was going through a tough time. You took over as CEO for a while. The company had, uh, you know, like an all-time high in terms of uh, um, stock performance or close to all-time high. And now you're kind of going through this transformation. It seems like the company was struggling quite a bit, going through a tough time. Can you talk a little bit about What's been going on with the brand, with the company, how you think about that? And I wanted to connect this to Peloton too, because similarly, Peloton was also riding a massive high during the pandemic. I think their stock price peaked near around $148 a share. Looking at Yahoo Finance, it's now around uh, $4.90 a share, which, I mean, talk about a fall from grace, my goodness. Um so talk about the, the relationship and the competition aspect there. Obviously, it's important to have competitors. They push you and they challenge you. And then I, I wanted to share kind of what some of the things that I thought Peloton did that was quite wrong in terms of overreaching. Um, but talk about what's going on with Nautilus and then how you view that competitive relationship with a company like Peloton. Yeah, absolutely. So when we got here in 2019, our company was going down and the industry was was going up. So it's different than right now where we're all kind of in a yeah. post pandemic um, hangover, if you want to think about it that way. Um, but uh, but things were different. So I, I kind of came in and said, look, what's great about this company? Great brands, reputation for quality. Um, our products are both in cardio and strength, all the modalities, as we call them, different price points. And we sell both retail and direct. So good things don't screw that up. Yeah. And the things that were gone wrong somewhat relate to Peloton. The first one was that we didn't know who our consumer was. We were actually selling mm -hmm. to the wrong consumer and running out of customers. Who, I don't who know are you selling to? In. We were selling to, to, the, to the type of fitness person that we had to get off the couch and into the game. Oh. And they didn't stay with it very long. They looked for shortcuts. 
and they uh, ended up using our stuff more as a coat rack over time. I know people um, I like think, that. I know people like that. I think it, yeah, I think it was our go-to-market, which is interrelated, right? So we we had sold with late-night infomercials for a long time, long-form commercials. Um, and so we were selling to people that, that would, uh, you know, come from that. And so as a result, we were four times over indexed uh -huh. with those types of consumers. We had 40% of our customers. I, first thing I do is always do a, a consumer first, um, segmentation of, of who your customers are. We had 40% of our customers, but only 10% out there in the wild. So we're four times over indexed with that segment, mm -hmm. which is ironically the most difficult one to, that, to, to keep buying and to stay with that they spend less, all that. So we're four times over indexed. And when we looked at the, an adjacent segment, which we call enthusiastic cross trainers, people might not love exercise, but they know it's going to be a part of their life forever. They know it's part of a, a broader view of wellness and health and nutrition and they spend more and they stay with it longer. And so we were the flip of that. We were a quarter un under penetrated. So we had only 10% in our population where there were 40% out in the wild. So we aimed everything towards that segment even before the pandemic uh, started. So that's how we kind of fixed your, it didn't matter what you're selling if you're gonna run out of customers cause you're too much over indexed. It's the first thing I look mm -hmm. at when you diagnose. The second thing is the trend we missed was connected fitness. We don't need to be like Peloton. We don't need to be 24 by seven studios and classes on bikes. They do that extremely well. And if people want to win on a leaderboard, let them do that in Peloton. So we really yeah. compete most uh, most in, in bikes with Peloton. Um, but when we looked at what connected fitness should be, it was all about individualized connected fitness, not, not a one to many class where maybe the instructor once in a while will call out your name, but that's as individualized as it gets. So our approach in our journey um, journey app is to make it all about you. We suggest a workout every time you get on that's just for you based on what your progress is, based on what we've seen. And we'll change it if you told us you had a couple of glasses of wine last night. You, But it's all about you. It's a one-to-one -one experience. We thought that was the way to go. So to get into connected fitness, we had to get an install base with um, equipment, with screens, and things like that to do it. So that was something that was wrong. And then um, the other thing was lack of focus. Like we have, we're a small company. We had 500 yeah. employees at the time. We were both in commercial, meaning what, selling what to Peloton gyms. What does have in terms of workforce? Are they much bigger in terms of employees? Uh, much, much, much bigger. And uh, in fact, for you know, they they bought um, Precore during the pandemic, which uh, they bought them for factory capacity. I told you we had a asset light model. We we knew that we were managing a. A, a huge upturn, and then we knew there would be a down a downslide after four, that. around 3,500 employees, according to Yahoo Finance. I don't know if that's accurate, but yeah, that's yeah. that's massive. That's probably pretty close. That's probably pretty close. Wow. And uh, yeah, so smaller smaller company. We mostly uh, compete in that. Uh, we, we're both connected fitness companies, and I admire what they've done. We just have a different brand of that. We go across all the modalities. Once you get on a treadmill, for example, you don't have this idea of a class. Yeah. You have an idea of explore the world. There's 300 places you can run in the world and we make it so you could, you know, if you run every day of the year, you don't have to run in another place. So in, in the same place twice. So kind of a different approach there. Um, I definitely feel like, uh, look, I wouldn't, it, 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 there, our whole industry is having a tough time now. So, you know, nobody's, go, you know, strutting around saying they know, they know what everything's going on, but, but for sure, um, they just had a different approach to it. Um, you know, they, uh, I think they may have assumed that it was going to be, um, a growth industry for a while where when we did yeah. our first strategy in 20, we, we said two up years and then at least two down years. And so we've, we've, we've kept our costs in line with that so that we could, we could compete better in that situation. So that's interesting. So they obviously both smart teams, both capable teams, you identified that it was going to be two up years, two down years. And I'm assuming now are the down years. Whereas to your point, they thought it was just going to be up, 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 up and for the foreseeable future. And I'm assuming you guys are looking at the same data points. So how do you identify and see things one way and they see things a completely other way and you're looking at the same piece of data? So how, how do you approach looking at trends? Like how did a company like Peloton miss it so much? Whereas you, and again, like to your point, the whole industry is struggling. I know you're... Um, your stock has gone down. Peloton stock has gone down considerably. So the whole industry is going through a tough time now. But how did you foresee that it would be two years um, up, two years down, whereas Peloton clearly did not make that assessment? 
And they might have decided that. I don't have any um, internal intelligence there. It, they just acted as if they were going to continue yeah, to grow. You know, they seem... added, yeah, they added apparel and some other things. I'm when when I did our strategy, when we did our strategy, we were subtracting things to know that we were going to have to to do fewer things better. We were going to have to stop doing stuff like stop selling in commercial. We ended up not using the Nautilus brand anymore. We um, got rid of about a third of our SKUs. We knew that we wanted to simplify um, both on the upside and the downside so that as we exited the transformation, that we were a much better company, not the company that we entered it that was going the wrong direction and going you know, down when the market was 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 going up. But I, I, I did think that um, they did think they were going to continue to grow and they kept investing big. Um, they made the decisions. Usually, you know, you add fixed costs if you think hey, my revenue growth is just going to be here for a while. And look, again, I admire them for the digital business that they've that they put together. I mean, they're yeah. they're they're kind of a company that has, um, uh, you know, a great digital business that um, and, you know, class experience that happens to come sometimes with equipment. And we are we're an equipment company that's excelled at that, knows how to make money at that, and then now is appending a digital experience that makes the makes the equipment better. So we came out at different directions, mm. and so we probably saw things um, a, a bit different as we as we looked at the direction. And then I just have to be realistic at a, you know, I've worked mostly at big companies. This is the first time I've worked at a company, you know, 500 employees or so, and uh, I have to be realistic about what we can do. And so maybe maybe in being realistic, I was a little less ambitious about what you know, we, we, we could be outside of our core and, and focus back on the core, the things that we could do well, as opposed to things that would be, you know, later growth engines. Yeah. I mean, to me, it felt like, and my wife writes books on customer experience and she studied the Peloton brand extensively as far as like what they did wrong. To me, it seems like they overreached quite a bit. Like they, I mean, they were expanding into apparel. They had the recall of the trend. Like they were, almost expanding and growing too quickly, which, you know, there is a danger in that. I think Zoom is another company, right? Didn't they also, uh, they were expanding so quickly during the pandemic and they were going through such a massive explosion. And I think even Zoom as a company, yeah, I'm looking at their, oh my, wow, that's crazy. They were almost $559, $559 a share down to 67. So it's, mm -hmm. it's crazy. It's almost like, Companies and the leaders who run them don't know what to do when things are going well, um, right? It's almost like a, like a kid when they're having a great time and they're getting a bunch of candy and they're like, "Hey, presents, present!" Like they can't self, they can't regulate their emotions. And similarly, when something bad happens to a child, they freak out like it's the end of the world and they throw a tantrum. And it seems like similarly, a lot of leaders that are running businesses they have a hard time gauging when things are going well to kind of keep things measured, you know, celebrate a little bit, like that's great, but you know, let's not assume that we're gonna, you know, be like this forever. I, I, why is that? I'm like, I'm trying to understand both Peloton, both Zoom. I'm sure there are lots of other companies out there during the pandemic, they skyrocketed, thought they were going to the moon. And then reality kind of like smacks them in the face two years later. I mean, I can't speak for 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 others. I mean, I know that when we had to make the same assessments that um, that Peloton did, for example, and some of these others, we asked ourselves, what is driving our growth? You know, we of course we want to think, oh yes, it's a great transformation we're we're yeah. doing at the company. Sure, that's part of it, but we were realistic enough to know that we were we were flying a little bit on or quite a bit on the pandemic. You know, like that first year. Um, you know, of course, we're all heroes. We almost triple our revenue, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, every, this is perfect strategy. But, but we know, look, people were buying everything they could buy. And, you know, we were, oh, the reason um, we, we didn't more than triple our revenue there is we could only make things so fast. And, and so we did, we did our best and we captured the opportunity. Um, but we, we knew that this is driven by, you know, or at least our assessment was this was driven by something that's, that's temporary, not permanent. Um, and we knew there would be a, a downside on the other thing. And I think, you know, you just tend to say, OK, if you think it's permanent or you think most of it's permanent, then you make different decisions. Like you build factories, yeah. you build uh, you, you take on fixed costs and things like that. But we, we didn't really believe that. And I think as it's come down, I think what we are, we've come to believe is, you know, 
some people say, do you wish the pandemic never happened? Because then you had to go up and then down. It would have been better to be like, let's say hospitality, which was down right away and then up. Um, But honestly, it changed workout habits forever. Oh, yeah. Um, If we think about um, we we do a survey pre-pandemic all the way to now, um, you know, where do you work out? And about four out of 10 people worked out at home prior to the pandemic. It peaked in the 70 percent range. um, And then it's still 65 percent. So even as people go back to the gym, um, in some cases, they're continuing to work out at home. And so we have a permanent Um, change in our industry. We believe our industry will end up being quite a bit larger post-pandemic than it was pre-pandemic. That's the home fitness part because Mm -hmm. these habits have changed profoundly. Probably the big driver that we all, you know, seem to know is is working from home. You're going to work from home or a hybrid model some days. You're going to need stuff at home like you have dumbbells. And then you may go to the gym, but you're probably going to pick a maybe a low-cost gym for 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month. And you're going to go there when it's opportunistic to go there. People have their different habits. They work out different places. But so we have a long term right now, as we assess it, we have long term tailwind because those habits have permanently changed. And we're assessing that we have a short term, um, uh, sorry, tailwind. And we have a short term headwind, which are things we don't control, right? They're things like is the consumer going to buy discretionary items this holiday? How much yeah. will they trade down? We don't control that, but we make sure that we have price points all the way um, top to bottom there. Um, we, we can't control um, uh, how much of sales were pull forward. In other words, how many, how many people bought stuff and don't need it for a couple more years. Yeah. And we don't control retailers. Retailers are a big thing. We sell about half direct and half retail. And our retail channel, they bought so much inventory for that second COVID holiday that they're still selling that inventory and not reordering at the same rate they would have. So that's distressing for our people to see that. But we just keep stressing it is a long-term tailwind, yeah, but short-term headwind. We have to manage what we can control in the, in the short term, cut the costs, uh, make sure that we're agile, strengthen our balance sheet, inventory control. These are these are skills that when we were going on the other part of this, uh, weren't really t- uh, front and center. And that's where I think situational leadership comes in where, you know, there's mm-hmm. one there's one way to manage when you're on the upswing and another one when you're you're coming down. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been to a gym in three years. Uh, all right. I mean, pandemic invested so much in a home gym that now I mean, I might even have to go onto your website and look at some of the, the home gym stuff that you guys have on there, too, and <laughs> build out even more. Uh, Yeah, I I haven't been in three years. And I actually really like your point of looking at headwinds and tailwinds. So what would be an example? So in this case, obviously, you spotted the pandemic is going to be a temporary thing. And so it seems like the advice for leaders is pay attention to what's causing your growth, whether it's something that's short term or long term. What would have been more of an example of something that would have caused long term growth where you would have said, okay, we're going to be on this path for five or 10 years? Like what would have that been? for you to say, we're going to continue on this path? Well, I think we saw elements of that. And that could have been what uh, what Peloton was looking at, that more people would work out at home. Oh, you know, okay. that, that and that is a trend. But uh, but you, the thing that you had to spot, I think, in this case, um, and it's been painful for all of us, is is that there would be uh, something stopping that from happening at, a, at its own natural rate. The three things that I mentioned. And those are the causes for not getting, you know, even though the TAM has increased uh, for the industry, the accessibility of that of that uh, target market is is not a, not as accessible today because of the three things that I mentioned. But all those things are temporary. So you just have to get through to the other side. And so that's how we're playing the game is we're just saying, look, um, you know, our North Star strategy in transforming the company is still alive and well. But when we reduce it down to what does it matter this year, we, we reduce it down to, you know, three, what we call them wildly important goals. And the most important one is getting back to making money. Um, there was a time where um, where neither Peloton nor us or a lot of people in the capital markets, as long as you had a growth story, you could you could go into uh, you could lose money. But that's not the case in the capital markets. And so um, we know we got to get back to profitability Um, And so that's what we direct our people on. It's not like the long term vision isn't still there and the long term opportunity isn't still there. But we're more focused on, you know, our number one wig, as we call it, is back in black. So we got to get back in black and we've got it. 
to, uh, to, to get every employee has a goal around getting back in black and everybody can do something uh, to, to make that happen. Um, really quick before we jump into, um, or actually maybe we should just jump directly into uh, kind of the leader's toolkit stuff where I wanted to talk about digital transformation and some of your steps. So why don't we jump into that? And then a few things that I wanted to go over there are examples of what might be a short-term versus a long-term headwind or tailwind as the first question. And then to go through your five-step framework that you've created on digital transformation. I know you created it a couple of years ago. I'm curious if it's still relevant today, if there's anything that you would add or change on there. So why don't we start with the first piece there? Because I think for leaders out there, it is very, very important for them to know what the headwinds are, what the tailwinds are, and if those are something that could be short-term or if those are something that could be long-term. Any advice on how to tell if it's short-term or long-term? Are there some categories that are more short-term than long-term? How do you advise leaders to, to, to think about that so they know what they're dealing with? My conversation with Jim Barr continues if you are a premium subscriber of Great Leadership Plus on Apple Podcasts. And this is gonna be an important conversation for you to tune into because in this exclusive discussion with Jim, he's gonna actually share the five steps that he uses for spotting permanent versus temporary trends. And the five steps are assess the current situation, find your why, create your from here to their vision, develop an implementation plan, and evangelizing. So if you wanna know more about what those five steps are, what they entail, how to actually bring them to life, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to subscribe to Great Leadership Plus and Apple. If you want a weekly in-depth article that I write giving you strategic advice and insights as well as weekly leadership hacks, head over to greatleadership.substack.com. And lastly, of course, if you get a couple of seconds, please send this episode to a coworker, a friend, a peer, somebody who you would like to see become a better leader. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.